Hi, this is James Cook of the University of Maine at Augusta Social Science Program, and I'm recording this video as an introduction to the concepts of sex and gender in a sociological context and how they play out as elements of social structure. The answer, it turns out, is not that simple, but we'll begin with something simple, which is the notion of binaries. So to say something is binary is to say that something is either this or that. Uh, and to have two and only two possibilities. In that regard, uh, for oh, uh, a good 40 to 50 years, we have thought about binaries in two senses in the social sciences. One is a sex binary and another is a gender binary, and they are not the same thing. In this binary conception, the simplest conception of gender, um, there are two sexes and two genders. But when we start to take a, a closer look, we'll see that there are hints already, even in this binary conception, of something other than binary. For instance, when we look at sex. Uh, sex is supposed to be the biological makeup of people relative to reproduction. But it turns out that there are actually uh, three dimensions that we might consider when determining sex. And this is even in the classic sense. The first is genetics, uh, sex chromosomes, X's and Y's. The second is reproductive organs, those organs that are used like a uterus, um, like testes, um, primarily involved in the act of reproducing the species. And then there are secondary sex characteristics, things that are not necessary for uh, the reproduction of the species, but tend to go with genetics and primary sex characteristics, are correlated with them, like facial hair. Um, and so these secondary features, these uh, primary features, and then genetics are typically collapsed into two categories in the classical interpretation that there are males and females in the world. Now, gender is something different. Uh, gender is a set of socially constructed ideas of feminine and masculine expectations, right? For uh, uh, how people behave, for what beliefs they have, for what values they have, for how they carry themselves, act out in the world, and see themselves symbolically. These have typically been associated with the sexes. We've called them a uh, dichotomy of the masculine and the feminine. Um, often set them uh, at opposition to one another, so opposite that they might as well be on different planets. And uh, these categories, um, manhood, womanhood, are these things that males and females are to um, not necessarily automatically achieve, but are to aspire to. Full womanhood, full manhood, be a man, be a, be a woman, right? Um, what, what, what is it that a man is supposed to do? What is it that a woman is supposed to do? These expectations for behavior go beyond genetics. You're supposed to have an, two X's if, uh, to be a real woman, right? If that was enough to be a real woman in our society, then clearly sex and gender would be the same thing, but they aren't. Um, reproductive uh, organs and uh, secondary uh, sex characteristics. Is that enough to be a woman? Or is that the same thing as being a woman? Think about that carefully. Um, the same thing with uh, a manhood uh, and uh, malehood. The, the two um, have often considered uh, been considered to be different sets of things, right? Uh, being a man, how one acts as a man in the world. Uh, is not even secondarily related to reproduction, and yet they are there. Um, and manhood and malehood, womanhood and uh, femalehood um, are, are two dichotomies, two dichotomies that have classically been thought to line up. But that classical conception starts to crumble the closer we look at it. Now, you may be reacting with a little bit of cynicism to the claim I have right now that 
you know, there's more than just men and women. There's more than just males and females. There's more than these binaries. One of the reasons why was brought up uh, by Judith Lorber uh, some years ago when she said, um, you know, we get so used to it that we take it for granted. It's like a fish talking about water. And she says, gender is so much the routine for us that questioning its taken for granted assumptions and presuppositions is like thinking about whether the sun will come up or a fish thinking about the water that is around it. Gender is so pervasive in our society that we assume it is bred into our genes. Um, as we've indicated in many of the videos in, in, in this series for um, uh, sociology, uh, questioning those assumptions is one of the most useful things we can do as social scientists. Right? Well, we, so one of those assumptions is that, is that we assume uh, gender is sex. Uh, we say uh, that male is a synonym for man and female is a synonym for woman. Um, we also tend to see them together everywhere. So we think of that as natural, right? As an element of nature, this thing that is fixed. Is that really natural, all of that, um, number one? And number two, are they really just aspects of the same thing? Let's uh, start to unpack that, and we'll do that in a few ways. We're going to look for circumstances in which sex and gender um, don't seem to correspond. First of all, when biological sex does not align with gender. Second, when people don't follow gender expectations. And third, when gender expectations vary uh, by time and place, which um, should not be happening if this is a fixed biological property that is coming from the existence of um, chromosomes. Uh, that generate primary and secondary sex characteristics. So let's look at those in turn. Let's start with biology, and let's start with just the idea of biological sex as a binary. So the standard story that we are all told when we go to school is that sex uh, and, and, and gender are one. Boys and girls, boys have these parts, girls have those parts. And when we move on to middle school, we learn about chromosomes and we learn that there is an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. They don't actually look like X's and Y's. Um, they're kind of pairs of chromosomes that are bundled together, and if you really squint and imagine, one might look like an X and one might look like a Y. The Y is a smaller bit, the X is a bigger bit. Um, these are uh, pairs of chromosomes uh, that almost everyone has, but not everyone, and they are uh, among the most uh, um, modal uh, human category, that is the most common human category, part of the last two of 23 pairs of chromosomes. So if you have two X's, the standard story goes, oh, you're female, and then you're going to be a woman. And if you have uh, an X and a Y, then you are male, and this is the story goes, and you are going to be a man. Uh, that gender follows from chromosomes, and chromosomes are unproblematic. That's the standard story. It's just the, the miracle of life. But it's not always so, in a couple of ways. So the first is that the chromosomes themselves um, aren't always there in that neat configuration of two sex chromosomes, uh, and only two sex chromosomes. So there are individuals who you can see walking around um, who just have one uh, X chromosome. So they get along uh, in the world. They eat and breathe and walk like you and I do, um, and they exist. Uh, they confront the binary and they say, what am I? Because I am neither XX nor XY. Then there are XX males and XY females, right? Which is the opposite of the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be XX females and XY males. But there's this thing called translocation, which sometimes happens. So chromosomes do this 
amazing dance you can learn about in biology during um, reproduction where they um, unzip themselves and then they reconstitute themselves, reproduce themselves. But sometimes during that process, a chunk of one chromosome will break off and then float over and attach itself to a chunk of another chromosome. So that means that a if a chunk of a Y chromosome attaches itself to an X chromosome, a person can have two X chromosomes and have uh, primary and secondary sex characteristics um, that we would associate with maleness. So that doesn't line up. Um, it's, it's something other than the binary. And the reverse can happen as well. A portion of an X chromosome translocates onto a Y and exifies the Y, they still have that big X chromosome and they still have a small Y chromosome, but the genetic expression creates a body that appears to us by sight female. So what do we do with that? Then there's the notion of just two sex chromosomes. Well, it's possible to have trisomy, uh, which means having three sex chromosomes, three X's. That's not an XX, that's an extra X. And then there's an X, an X, and a Y, or an X and two Ys. Um, super Ys, they're called. Um, so what do we think such people are? Um, you can go beyond that. You can have a tetrasomy and pentasomy. Yes, you can have penta stands for five. You can have as many as five uh, sex chromosomes and be here in the world. What are such people if we assume that only biological binaries are possible. It's not just chromosomal either. So after the genetics, right, if we only had genes, we would be nothing but piles of genes, but we are so much more. Um, the genetic code uh, is expressed in the creation of proteins, which not only directly create um, <clears throat> chemicals, but interact with one another in such a profound way that there's a whole branch of network science looking at the interactions of proteins to carry out um, the construction of bodies and the action of bodies in the world in anatomy and physiology and even psychology and sociology. Um, so all of that chemical interaction that happens starting at the smallest level, but blossoming beyond that, can have little hiccups that lead to differences in primary and secondary um, sex characteristics, even among those people who have a very clear XY or XX. So you could have a genetic XX female and there's no translocation or anything like that going on. And yet that person can have a deficiency of cortisol. And when that happens, um, adrenocortisol levels will increase to compensate for that. That's a wonderful thing that our bodies do is if we don't have something of one chemical, they'll uh, increase the level of a similar chemical to pretty much get the job done. It's only pretty much though, because one of the things that is true about that prefix adreno in adrenocortisol is that um, it, it, it means that it has a, a, a masculinizing uh, effect. So that leads to this masculinizing effect, um, male uh, hormones, uh, which are present in every uh, woman's body, uh, in most women's bodies, goes up uh, above a level that is normal, and it leads to the formation of what looks like a male body. So, it's a genetic XX female with an appearance that looks kind of male, uh, or pretty darn male. On the other hand, you have androgen insensitivity syndrome. So, there are all kinds of androgens out there in the world. Um, there's um, high, uh, testosterone, there's dihydrotestosterone, um, to which I'm actually uh, insensitive, which is why I can't really grow a beard. Um, 
So well, what does that make me? Go figure. But if one is really insensitive to a number of critical androgens, it's, it's possible that a genetic XY males will develop external female genitalia and breasts because the androgens which would lead to the creation of male bodies um, are absent uh, in terms of their chemical interaction with the body. They're there, but they just can't chemically interact. Just like, you know, some people have lactose intolerance. So their bodies don't respond to the, the, the male hormones that would trigger those cycles. Um, but they do respond to the estrogens that are there in every male body. Yes, they are. And so what you actually have are individuals who often uh, have a highly um, uh, female appearance. Um, and <laughs> yet they uh, find out sometimes when they are going in for infertility research, why can't I have a baby? they find out that they are actually genetic XY males, genetically speaking. And then that triggers this crisis. Who am I? Or what am I? Am I even human if I am not either male or female? Well, um, you're, you're human for certain, but you don't fit in that binary. The binary doesn't fit everybody. And there are, in addition to this, a number of other intersex uh, conditions where uh, an individual, uh, a, a woman who is gestating, carrying a fetus, can have a chemical incident or they can have an illness and it can lead to um, all kinds of changes in, in hormones in the fetal environment that lead to a baby being born who um, is differentiated in a way that doesn't fit into the very neat lineup of genes, primary sex characteristics, and secondary sex characteristics. In the past, uh, doctors have come in and said, well, let's do some cutting, slicing, and dicing to make everybody fit. Um, we learned uh, through time that that uh, is only uh, working with appearance, uh, and it only works so far. Um, and that these differences nevertheless remain, sometimes hidden, um, sometimes a stitch together or cut apart, but they remain. And those individuals are real. Uh, they are human. They play a part in our society and yet do not fit in the neat binary categories of male and female. So the second thing that can happen when we try to think about sex and gender as binaries is that the gender um, idea of lining up neatly with these two supposed sex categories, male and female, uh, well, it often doesn't happen. And one of the reasons that we can realize that not everybody lines up with the expectations we have for how males will behave, or supposed males, as men or uh, females will behave, or supposed females, identified females, as women, um, is the existence of a humor line. Now, humor is this funny thing, right? Um, literally. But what humor is all about is the idea of um, crossing a line. That two things that are not supposed to go together do. And when we see those two things that are not supposed to go together yet do go together, uh, we recognize that a line has been crossed, that there's been a transgression, and it triggers us to laugh. Whether we laugh out of discomfort, whether we laugh out of pleasure, whether we laugh out of recognition, we laugh out of the recognition that a line has been crossed. And you can see this, uh, the, where the lines are by looking at our humor. How much humor in our society is about men being this way and women being that way, and then actually trying to accomplish that, and then it falling apart? The answer is a whole lot. 
um, we can look at what we think is funny by using technology. One of the neat things about technology is that in some ways it archives what our sense is So um, of, of what is funny. So let's take a look at one example. Let's look at funny football pictures, okay? You can search for this on uh, Google using a feature called uh, Google Images, which is images.google.com. It will give you a result, and these results will be where there are words like funny and, and football that are used um, around the image or in the alt uh, text, the alternate text for an image that is supplied for accessibility to describe it. Um, and the pages that are linked to the most by the most influential pages, plus a little bit of extra secret sauce that Google won't tell us about, makes certain results come up to the top. They're the ones that are the most salient. They're the ones that most influential pages link to. They're in the top of our collective mind. Let's take a look at what comes up. This is the result. As of today, in the middle of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, um, these are the results. By the time you search, they may be different. Look at what's going on here. So first of all, we can see, number one, um, that um, these are masculine or masculine appearing bodies. So that says something about our assumption of gender in sport. That's important to pay attention to. But second, look at what these bodies are doing. Okay, there are a couple of exceptions. So some things not supposed to happen. Well, someone get hit with a soccer ball in the face. There's a strange furry animal behind a soccer ball. That's not supposed to happen. But apart from that, Look at all these pictures. What they show is men uh, expressing themselves in ways that they're not supposed to, uh, showing emotion. Um, more commonly, uh, men touching other men uh, in ways that seem to simulate uh, sexual interest in one another. And that's funny. Um, funny in the sense that it crosses a line that makes people nervous, makes people uncomfortable, or makes people amused, particularly when we think about sports. So this has nothing to do in these pictures directly with primary sex characteristics. They are not on display, although they're referred to. It's conduct surrounding them, right? That is referred to. Uh, secondary sex characteristics, I don't see any beards. Um, there is the secondary sex characteristic supposed of uh, big, strong, agile, in control. And the, but these individuals are out of control of their bodies. They're out of control of their emotions. And this is kind of like a secondary gender characteristic almost, right? It is not associated with reproduction at all, um, but it is associated with something else. It's not uh, even necessarily directly physical, but it's what these men do with their bodies. Um, in a few cases, they are simply expressing themselves enthusiastically, which is again, something that a man is not supposed to do. Men are supposed to be contained, controlled, not using their hands um, when they express and yet they are. These are lines that are gender lines, not sex lines. They're not lines of reproduction. They're not um, about secondary sex characteristics. They're about behavior and expectations for behavior and expectations for what is not acceptable. When people do not follow gender expectations, which often can be quite rigid, we can tell a lot uh, about what those expectations are and how seriously they're taken based on how other people react to them. Now, one reaction is laughter. The laughter can be a laughter of uh, recognizing a mistake. It can be a laughter of um, recognizing a violation. It can be mockery that is meant to 
put someone back in place, that demeaning laughter that makes someone think, I will never do that again. Um, there are other actions that can occur when uh, somebody engages in behavior that is not in line with gender expectations. And we even have classifications of such gender violators. So here are just a few of them. Transgender people, people who transcend gender lines, literally, that transcendence is what transgender um, is about. Non-binary, which means someone who does not fit in that neat um, sex categorization into two categories, which results in two sets of very clear and two, uh, 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 and only two sets of expectations for behavior. Someone who works beyond those lines. Someone who, particularly in their conduct, um, sexually in their choice of a romantic or sexual partner, chooses someone of the quote-unquote wrong sex. Going across that line, uh, often comic figures on TV are gay figures or lesbian figures. Not a mistake. Um, it's a cultural reaction. Then there can be individuals who, you know, it's not about their romantic partner. It's not about their gender or sexual identity. But it's just the way they go about so a girl who uh, likes to get dirty and fix things and climb trees and chase animals, go out camping, uh, goes out for sports, we have a name for such a person, tomboy. Um, a boy who um, likes to paint. A boy who likes to sit and think quietly, who likes to make friends with all kinds of people and tells them he loves them. Um, a little boy like that, um, one word for such a boy is emo, another word uh, that w was used more often in uh, previous decades was sissy. Um, often words will be used for such a, a person that label them as clearly um, both a sex violator and a gender violator. Uh, they might be called queer, um, they might be called gay, or a faggot, or a dyke. Um, so, think about what you have seen in your town that you've grown up, or your city that you've grown up in. Um, if you grew up a long time ago, think about that. Think about, then, two other questions. How do the people who have been labeled this way manage that situation? What can those people do? Um, there are a lot of ways that people react to um, being put in an other category, um, ostracized, um, made to feel as though they do not belong to the main group. Um, think about that a little. I'm not going to provide that answer, but um, think about how that has been managed um, by people. How have they managed to find different outcomes? Um, and then, how have those outcomes changed over time. So these questions are not hypothetical. They're about how uh, people who don't fit in gender expectations, who don't follow them, um, or by accident of birth are unable to find themselves following them. Uh, what happens to such people? For a category of, of people um, transgender, there is a, a Transgender Day of Remembrance, a Trans Day of Remembrance, to use the shortening that is, is coming into popularity, November 20th of each year. Uh, the purpose of this day is to bring social attention particularly to the violence that happens, um, is committed against transgender people around the world. Because um, uh, engaging in physical violence against transgender, transgender people is something that is unfortunately uh, common, and it can result in death. So the um, Trans Murder Monitoring uh, Project is a project that collects the reports of the deaths we know about uh, of, of homicides uh, committed against trans people, instances in which they've been murdered. 
um, and it, it is counted uh, starting on October 1 of every year and ending uh, next year on September 30th. And then it is uh, introduced uh, in the month of November, the tally. The most recent tally, as of the recording of this video, is that there are 350 known cases of trans people being murdered um, in that period, October 1st, 2019, to September 30, 2020. That's up 6% from the year before, um, which is an additional 21 people, roughly. Uh, compared to the year before. So it's an increase, at least in those that we know um, are people who are transgender and that we find out that they're murdered. It turns out that the reaction uh, to trans people is not symmetric. Uh, it, it tends to uh, specifically be trans women or trans femme people, feminine um, individuals who uh, take on a feminine gender identity. Although the sex they were assigned at birth is male. And as we know, that assignation is not without controversy. 98%, 98 out of 100, only 2 out of 100 are trans men or trans masculine, which says something about what it is in gender that is an unacceptable line to cross. If you think about these labels from the previous page, when a girl is a tomboy, that is, uh, tries to act like a boy, that is acceptable to some degree. Um, people say, why don't you try putting on a dress or something like that? But if a boy is emo or sissy, they get beat up. Um, they can be killed. Uh, here in Maine, uh, the famous case of Charlie Howard in Bangor, thrown off a bridge, would have been with us and alive today if he were not murdered for not uh, being inside the gender lines. 38% of those murders took place on the street. They're public acts, and that is something that's really worth uh, noting, right? A public act, a murder on the street, is not just, it's not a private act, right? Most murders don't take place on the street. Most murders uh, in the United States um, take place in private. Um, but the fact that 38% of the murders, a large share of trans people do take place on the street is an indication that this is a sign. It's a social sign that this is to the murderer unacceptable behavior that must be punished. It is a line. Um, that the murderer finds uh, it, it's unacceptable for that, the, the trans person who's been killed to have crossed. One of the interesting things about the pattern of the murder of transgender people, beyond the fact of these gray zones, which is areas from which we just don't get any data collected at all, such as a lot of Africa, Eastern Europe, um, especially is that for the countries where data has been collected and it is available, there's a lot of variation in the tendency for that to happen. So, United States is relatively high. Turkey, Italy, relatively high, really high are the Central and South American countries places where traditional ideas of masculinity as a set of gender uh, performances uh, have very rigid lines beyond which uh, men are not supposed to go. Um, and if you have been assigned at birth a male, you are supposed to be a man. And if you do not perform uh, that manhood, look at the, the deep color here that these are, these are numbers reported uh, per unit population, so it's controlled for population. There are certain cultures, including Central America, South America, and the United States of America, uh, along with Turkey and Italy, um, to other uh, 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 nations of machismo, where uh, to be a trans person is to be in danger. 
That says something if we think back to the idea of the gender and sex binaries, that there are two sexes, males and females, and that males very neatly fall into the masculine man role, and that females fall very neatly into the um, feminine woman role. If this were non-problematic, first of all, there would be no trans people. Second, in some places, the murder rate for trans people is relatively low, and in other places, it's relatively high. That's an indication of culture. That's an indication that how people react to violations of these expectations is not a matter of biology. It's not a matter of destiny. It's not just the way it is. It's just the way it is in these places, which is key. Because those places at those times are not biological, that's cultural. If you recall, if you've been taking the Introduction to Sociology course with me, culture is uh, the set of expectations for behavior, for values, for beliefs that occur in a time and a place that marks a society. And what this map shows is that gender and the system for enforcing gender is cultural, not biological. If it were biological, then people from North and South America would have trouble mating with people from their relatively tolerant nation of Germany because we would be so fundamentally different in our sex, which determines gender? No. Uh, there's no problem in that reproduction at all. It's not a matter of genes. It's a matter of culture. And that's what that map shows us, that unfortunate map. Uh, which on November 20th, uh, many people uh, take a moment to look at and to think about very carefully uh, because it is a matter of life and death. Um, as I say at the beginning of every Introduction to Sociology course, what you don't know about social structure can kill you, and this is one of the ways it can. So, to think about what happens when that supposed system of uh, uh, normative, because that's what cultures are, they're norms, normative gender uh, is transcended and violated uh, either um, through action or through identity. Uh, two new words have come up, uh, and, and it's often assumed that people know what they are, but uh, I want to take a moment to talk about them in the 21st century. The idea of cisgender, cis means um, uh, conforming to or same with, uh, in alignment with, is referring to somebody whose sense of their personal gender, their masculinity or femininity or other gender, as we'll see if we move beyond the binary, matches with the sex category that they were assigned at birth. So that there are many people for whom they are born uh, female, uh, and it is a, a nice, neat, easy path to femininity, which they wholly embrace. And many individuals who are born and assigned male at birth, if someone looks at their body and says, ah, I detect un a clear evidence of maleness, uh, goes ahead and embraces the masculine. And that is part of their identity. They feel it to their bones. Uh, that is someone who is cisgender for whom all of these categories line up very neatly. And then there is transgender, someone who translocates, who transcends these boundaries. Someone who has been transported uh, outside of that box. It's a person whose sense of personal uh, gender, and what that sense means, uh, we, we'll talk about it in a minute does not match the sex category that they were assigned at birth. Now, that can happen because uh, the sex category they were assigned at birth uh, was not in biological alignment with some features of what was going on. It can happen because a sense of a person's uh, beliefs, values, and expectations regarding themselves and their identity do not correspond with uh, what society has told them should 
uh, be going on in terms of values, beliefs, and expectations uh, for the sex category they've been placed in. Uh, and such a person is transgender. And there are an increasing number of people who identify as transgender, who don't fit in the binary. Um, who may also say, I am binary, I am non-binary, excuse me, um, who may find that their um, sense of gender is fluid. So you may hear someone talk about uh, being gender fluid, which means one day they may feel more masculine, the next day they may feel more feminine. There may be one day where they feel neither of the above um, and identify as neither of the above. Such a, a, a person fitting under the transgender uh, uh, umbrella would uh, be gender mobile or gender fluid. So when we start to see these non-binaries, to recognize that there are people whose gender, whose set of values, beliefs, and expectations do not fit in the traditional masculine-feminine binary, that there are people whose sex does not fit within the uh, neat, nice conception of two uh, and only two sexes. Neat and nice meaning um, well-defined and simple, not necessarily desirable. Uh, so how do we then, as sociologists, think of these terms, sex and gender, if there are not binaries, if, if there are people who live outside the binary. We, in the sociology of gender over the last 20 years, have returned to these definitions. And we've started to think a little bit more broadly about them. So, to hum a few bars, let's go. So sex, what is sex then? Well, there's something biological going on with sex. It's the biological makeup of people relative to a number of things. Their genetics, their sex chromosomes, Yes, which can be um, uh, both, uh, uh, they could be translocated or they, they could be multiples. They don't have to be binaries just in uh, sex chromosomes. Reproductive organs, which uh, when we look at studies of reproductive organs, we know that there are not just two kinds of reproductive organs that one either fits perfectly into or not. Um, sizes, shapes, functions, parts, they vary, um, in, in, even in the primary sex characteristics. Secondary sex characteristics also vary from minor versions like guys like me who cannot grow a beard and will never be able to grow a beard because I am uh, intolerant to dihydrotestosterone. Um, and, but, 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 but also other individuals, short men, tall women. Um, we can go on and on, ways in which bodies don't fit the cookie cutters that we provide. Um, and so we end up with multiple varieties of maleness, multiple varieties of femaleness, and then this idea of intersex, which is the idea that they're, they're distributions of characteristics, which some of which can occur in some configurations and other ones of which can occur in other configurations. And what do we call such people? Well, the term intersex is a, a popular uh, term lately for, for speaking of biological um, uh, differences, but those terms change, and uh, they change as our understandings change. But that's just sex. Then there's gender, which is the cultural part, the socially constructed set of expectations for identity and behavior that in some traditions, we might say traditional meaning in some traditions, are associated with those sex categories, but um, in some other traditions are not associated with them at all or are decreasingly associated with them. And notice the list of categories here also increases because it is true that there is um, actually multiple sets of characteristics, ways that uh, one can be a man, one can be a woman. There are just more than one kind of woman. Um, so sure, you could say general man, general woman, but you can also say someone could be a sissy, they could be a tomboy. Those are, are names that have been claimed by people, and there are communities of people who label themselves as sissies and say, I'm proud to be a sissy. And then there are people who uh, identify as queer, or butch, or trans, or metrosexual. Um, 
meaning uh, it's a metropolitan culture of, of men who wear makeup. That has nothing to do with the um, functioning of their testes. And it's a cultural aspect. Um, the femme identity, the bear identity, Google it, uh, non-binary, gender fluid, bi-gender, um, all of these are possibilities. And you start to realize there's a lot of genders out there, right? Think of all the different kinds of um, expressions that we associate in our minds, uh, expectations for people of certain um, sexualities, of secondary sex characteristics that they display, of behaviors that they display, and ways that they change their display to indicate this is what you can expect of me, and this is what I can expect of myself. This is who I am. I've put the infinite sign there because really this redefinition of gender recognizes that <laughs> the sky's the limit. To the extent that we can think it, we can be it. It is an entirely different way of thinking of gender. So one way of getting a grip on this, uh, this amazing variation that happens in the world, is to work with uh, an image that has um, been created by the Trans Student Educational Resources Center, which is great. Um, I want to show you just for a second. Yeah, it, yeah, it works across the, the world. This is Das Gender Unicorn and Geschlechtsausdruck, which means gender expression. Um, it's available around the world in multiple languages. The idea of this gender unicorn, right? Okay, why unicorn? Partially because unicorns are cute and they're also part of the cultural um, uh, 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 zeitgeist right now. But also because it refers to all these different colors of possibility each of which in this graphic represents a dimension of possibility. So when we're talking about culture, right, one of the strengths of culture and one of the uh, amazing uh, 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 variations in culture, the diversity of culture, is that there are so many dimensions. You can have uh, expectations for beliefs, what you think is true, values for what you think are, is important, expectations for how you will behave, expectations for how others will react to you, um, dress, um, material objects, like, you know, a wallet is a material object, but am I carrying a wallet or will I carry a purse? That is gender um, right out there. And so let's start to think, as the Trans Student Educational Resources Center does, um, about these different dimensions and how they can all line up or not. Um, so there's gender identity. Who do you in your heart, in your mind, in the center of your soul, consider yourself to be? Now you notice it's not a single um, dichotomy along one dimension where you're either uh, really a boy or really a girl, and if you're one, you're not the other. It's possible in this formulation of gender for you to identify yourself as very strongly female, like the arrow could go way out, or very strongly male in terms of what we would consider sex. Um, you could consider yourself very strongly a woman, very strongly a man. Uh, you could consider yourself very strongly both, or you can consider yourself neither really masculine nor feminine. Uh, and then there might be other genders out there, other sets of expectations and cultural ideas that might be signified by dress or behavior, by words you use, by signs and symbols, the way you uh, move your body, the way you fix your hair, that might not be reducible to man or woman or boy or girl at all. Gender expression, then, is apart from identity, how do you act out in the world? How do others actually experience you. What is it that you do? And there can be feminine, masculine, or other um, uh, expressions. If you've ever been to a drag ball, one of the most interesting things that happens at a drag ball is when uh, something comes out that is not masculine and it is not feminine. It is entirely other. I once uh, at a drag ball saw um, someone come in with the Sydney Opera House on their head. What is that? <laughs> it is other, and uh, wonderfully so. Um, then there's the idea of the sex you were assigned at birth, uh, which is already complicated, as we know. Um, 
who are you physically attracted to? You could be attracted to women. You could be attracted to men. Uh, you could be attracted to neither. You could be attracted to both very much. You could be attracted to people who exhibit other gender, right? Uh, the Sydney Opera House. And then there's the notion that, you know, this physical attraction, this desire for physical experience and contact is not the same as emotional attraction. Uh, one of the features that we know about in, in the world is that there are some cultures in which there's a great deal of homosociality between men, not homosexuality, but homosociality in many countries of the world. Many of the same countries of the world that have a very a uh, large problem with same-sex contact between men, uh, that's sexual contact, will have uh, a cultural norm that men can put their arms around each other, that they will hold hands walking the street. Um, one of the features of American culture is homosociality between women, that women form strong emotional bonds with one another, right? So. And then you can be emotionally attracted to individuals who exhibit genders that don't fit in those categories. Um, all of those are possibilities. And the combinations, as you can see, if, if you think about how many possible combinations and permutations they are, each with their own strength, um, they're endless. Now, to be clear, the gender unicorn is itself a cultural document that is saying these are the elements that we hold to be important. One of the things that is true about the capacity for human creativity is that there are individuals who are more conservative than the gender unicorn would indicate, culturally speaking, and who would reject some of these um, uh, uh, possibilities as reasonable. Uh, and you can see then in culture, what would the appropriate response to these be? Would it be verbal? Would it be uh, body language? Uh, would it be some form of action? On the other hand are those who have said, yeah, gender unicorn, that was a nice stepping stone, but it's missing certain pieces, or it's got certain problematic pieces. Like, as a sociologist, I would say that gender identity, that top one, notice how female and woman and male and man are still equated, necessarily. Uh, it, it, it would seem to um, make impossible uh, the idea of a femme man, for instance, right? Or uh, a, a, a masculine woman. Uh, so there have been critiques um, on what we call might call a more liberal side, liberal meaning open to more possibilities and accepting of more possibilities. So that we may move beyond a gender unicorn and there have been debates in the trans community. Well, well what do we think of as embodying in, in, you know, one page, how do we embody all these possibilities now as we begin to think more openly about this? But this is just one interesting image that captures culture at a moment <laughs> in German as well. So the interesting thing about sexual orientation, right? Gender expectations for behavior, well, sexual behavior is one of them. And when we think about sexual orientation, that is often taken as a euphemism for uh, uh, one of two or three possibilities. Um, are you straight, right, same sex? Are you gay or homosexual or lesbian, opposite sex? Or in some cultures, are you bisexual? Although there are individuals who would say, uh, assert that bisexuality does not exist. There are individuals out there who, who say, uh, actually, that's interesting you say, bi people don't exist, bisexual people don't exist because I am such a person, they will say. Um, but if we think about all these orientations, uh, <laughs> the English person, identity, expression, physical attraction, emotional attraction, when we think about sexuality, it's not just about the sexuality or the gender of the person who is sitting opposite from you and that you are attracted to physically or emotionally in some way. There's so much more that culture can uh, conceive of and can uh, lead to expressions of and lead to generation of names for. We name things when they become these uh, uh, regular groupings of behaviors and beliefs and values. So, Gail Rubin, way back in 1984, 
made a room of feminist scholars really angry when she introduced this graphic. It was a long time ago, right? Um, 30 years ago. So, actually more than that, more than 30 years ago, by far. More than a generation ago, she said, look, it's just one dimension. And that is this dimension, this little slice of the pie that most people are thinking of when they talk about sexual orientation. And that is this one at the top of the image called heterosexual homosexual. But there's so many more possibilities than that. Um, so there's the idea of how you engage in these relationships. Is, do you do it by getting married or are you living in sin? Are you monogamous or promiscuous? Notice. Um, there's a certain valuation of these, and, 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 and Gail Rubin was clear about that. She's talking about a charmed circle on the inside, which are the more commonly cultural, culturally accepted modes of being. It is more culturally accepted to be in a heterosexual uh, uh, relationship than a homosexual uh, relationship. People are less likely to yell at you on the street for being straight than they are to yell at you on the street, or worse, for being gay. Um, people are more likely to approve if you engage in married relationships, much less likely to approve if you engage in sin. Sin is disapproval, uh, strong cultural disapproval, so codified that we call it religion. Monogamy, um, and uh, some uh, have used the word polyamory lately, um, others use the word, it's a pejorative word, promiscuous. The word promiscuous is a value judgment on that sort, but it is possible. It is possible to engage in sex for purposes of procreation and reproduction of the species, but also you could do it with no intention of uh, uh, procreating, especially given modern technologies. Um, you can do it for free or for money. There's certainly a judgment that is associated with that in many cultures, uh, both uh, large cultures and subcultures. Do you do it in couples or do you do it by yourself? or in groups. Um, you can go all the way around this uh, 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 circle and you can find approved and non-approved versions, yes. So that's about cultural uh, disdain versus approval. The outer limits versus the charm circle. But it also shows that there are so many different dimensions of sexuality. Only one of which is having to do with actual reproduction of the species. And it's one half of one of those wedges, the procreative versus non-procreative. Most sexual behavior is not about reproduction. It's about expression of identities, beliefs, values, expectations um, that are generated by single people, by couples, by groups. All of these things happen. And it's a huge variety, so huge that I challenge you to think of dimensions of the charmed circle and the outer limits that are not captured in Gail Rubin's 1984 graphic. What is she missing? Uh, there's a lot out there, um, and you may be able to uh, uh, talk about it, even if uh, it's something that we're not supposed to talk about at the dinner table, or even in college classes. So finally, when we think about variation in gender over time, I, I, I want to show you these pictures because um, you, the idea of these clothes, if they were to occur in uh, 2020 or anywhere in the 2020s, in this decade that is becoming, we would look at these and we would say, oh, well, those are feminine. That would be on a girl. But uh, in the middle picture, that's a boy, and that was uh, uh, typical uh, uh, boy's behavior uh, in terms of the clothes that they would wear. Little young boys, little, little three-year-olds, four-year-olds. It was thought to be the, just the darndest thing. The, the, the piece on the left is in the uh, Smithsonian uh, collection. That is a boy's garment. And the person on the right is a president. Uh, well, not elected at the time, you have to be 35 years of age, but that's Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And you look at those 
objects, and they would be considered they would be considered girls' clothing now, and not appropriate for boys. But they were considered highly appropriate for little boys, um, not for not for big boys, but for little boys. And then there was this practice called breaching, when when boys would move from wearing dresses to wearing pants, but. Little boys would well wear dresses all the time. Look at Christopher Robin and the original uh, Shepherd drawings for Winnie the Pooh. He's kind of wearing frilly things, um, even as a young boy. Um, so there's a really interesting book called Pink and Blue Telling the Girls from the Boys in America. It's by Joe Pauletti, who is a professor of textile sciences, which I never knew existed as a whole discipline, but it does. And she went through and she found in the Smithsonian collection all these references to gender. So if you go back to 1920, right? So this is a, you know, this is like the Roosevelt era, okay? These are, uh, paper dolls, and it's Baby Bobby. It's a little boy who has the expression of large eyelashes, curly locks, um, tiny fingers, uh, the Mary Jane shoes, um, rosy cheeks, and, and frilly undergarments. And you can put the nice dresses for Bobby on top. Notice the pink, the green, the, 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 the yellow. This is not blue. This is not camouflage. This is what boyhood was um, in 1920. In 1960, well, we'll go ahead, to, but let's stick to 1918 first. There's an interesting quote at the bottom of this slide um, from Earnshaw's department store, which is answering the question for young parents who say, what color should I put my kids in? And it says, oh, you should put them in pink if it's a boy, because pink is a strong color, whereas blue is delicate and dainty. Now notice, delicate and dainty is still associated with girls, right? And strong um, and decided is dis associated with boys, right? Masculinity. But the colors, as signifiers of that, have shifted. Um, they shifted between 1918 and the current day. In the 1960s, which lay in between, there was this unisex idea. So there were these um, patterns, right? They had this kind of paper you could cut out and you could kind of see through them so you could see what was underneath. And the idea was you would make the same clothing for little boys and little girls, slightly older boys and slightly older girls. It would be the same thing. They would wear them and it wouldn't make a difference. Um, that unisex cultural idea had its moment, and it has now gone back into uh, a time of great sexual differentiation in clothing.